you're a currency, uh, you may have different and more lenient rules than if you're a security. And if you're a commodity, you may have an entirely separate set of rules than being a currency or a security. And if you're completely something different, you may essentially have a whole bunch of rules made up for you because you're something entirely different. And one thing that, like I said, food for thought is what do we classify these new technologies? Even if we were to create something that's very similar to something that exists, like well, one thing that I've been working on for a little bit were uh, dividend yielding shares on the blockchain. So essentially these are tokens, they're really NFTs, but they're tokens associated with the dApp. And as the dApp has different applica different users engage with it, pay for execution, those execution fees essentially get split amongst a set of uh, token holders in the form of dividends. And sort of the big question that I have is, well, typically a dividend yielding application that has some sort of shares associated with it is a security. But at the end of the day, these things are operating autonomously. So let's say I were to Satoshi it and launch some application out there and they never knew who created it. Would it still be a security if no one essentially runs the app, but it still issues dividends? It's, it's a very weird question in that. Or let's say I was able, one thing I wanted to talk about, just a tad bit were um, new means of monetization for dApps on the blockchain. So traditionally, we would look at applications being monetizable through uh, advertisements or subscriptions or even sales where like an eBay or something, they may sell a product and have fees on top of it. But with the blockchain, we may end up seeing something a bit different. And one thing I like to sort of point out, which is sort of a native feature of the blockchain is pay per execution. Now, one thing that's sort of a, a basic tenet of the blockchain is whenever you make an engagement, um, you essentially have to pay some sort of uh, network fee. And on XTC, our fees tend to be incredibly cheap, uh, like one ten thousandth of a cent, something like that. But what, in, what you end up getting is, well, because in order to engage with the network, you have to pay a network fee, you can essentially start seeing applications also having application fees. Uh, and instead of having advertisements, which essentially may deplete the, uh, may deplete, oh, I see BlockFi coming up here. Yeah, it looks like we're having a little technical difficulties with Twitter, but, um. But instead of having advertisements that may essentially uh, hinder the performance or uh, hinder the usability of the application for the user, or subscriptions in which subscriptions are great, but what ends up happening is unless you fully utilize that application to the maximum potential, you're sort of leaving money on the table in which, like my example is if you have a $5 a month subscription and you only use the app once a month, you're kind of just paying five bucks to use the app once a month. Now, if you use the app every day, all day, like say it's Spotify or something, yeah, it may be great for you. But what you may end up seeing with paper execution on blockchain is you may be able to see applications become uh, profitable in a way that they don't have to sacrifice aspects of the app to advertisements while simultaneously be more economically friendly than subscriptions because you're basically paying for what you use. So a good example I like to use is uh, Duolingo. Uh, it's kind of one of my favorite apps. It's a language learning app. Oh my goodness, Twitter's being weird. I'm trying to get... If you're trying to come up, just keep ask, keep asking to come up. Eventually, Twitter's got to you know it's got to give eventually. But um, but essentially, a good a good example of, of an app that I really like is Duolingo. And Duolingo is a subscription app. I think it's like thirty dollars a year, or forty dollars a year, and it's great. But it's sort of broken up into these little packages and these lessons in which you can learn uh, a new language. And Duolingo is great in terms of subscription. If you're using it all day, every day, you're studying as hard as you can, you're doing everything you possibly can in terms of using it in every way, but you're only really gonna get your money's worth the more you use it. Where I was sort of thinking, I'm like, well, what if you had a Duolingo on the blockchain? Now, the first thing everyone may be saying is, well, couldn't you scan the blockchain and read the data? When you look at an app like Duolingo, you wanna learn Spanish, everything that there is to learn Spanish is already out there. You're not really paying for the I mean, you're paying for the information, but you're really paying for the access to the information and the means in which they allow you to access it. So the same sort of thing can happen on the blockchain, but instead of a subscription, you could essentially do pay per execution. So instead of essentially subscribing to uh, some sort of uh, application, you might just be able to pay to unlock some package or some module with, because I know Duolingo, they have like different modules as you progress. You can just unlock a module for let's say 25 cents, 50 cents. Do the module, move on to the next module. Move, do the module, do the next module. And let's say you get four or five modules in and you know maybe it dies off a little bit. You learned enough to sort of get around on your travel trips. Well, you might have just paid like two or three dollars for that bit of information, but you didn't have to pay the $30 a year for the entire subscription that you may not even use. And I think this is gonna be a huge model in dApps on the blockchain, simply based on the notion that you have to make an execution fee uh, every single time you want to uh, 
you have to make an execution fee every time you want to make a uh, transaction on the network. And you can have applications that uh, really are more profitable than they would be with advertisements without the downside of having ads, as well as them stealing your data to be able to issue those ads, uh, while simultaneously them being more economic uh, or more economical than subscriptions in which you have to pay a full subscription fee for a service you may not fully utilize. You can sort of get the best of both worlds in which uh, it's sort of like a subscription, but since you're paying per execution, you're getting your money's worth as you're engaging with it. And these applications are actually able to be a lot more profitable for it based on the notion that they're getting paid based off of engagement rather than how many ads that they feed or how many subscriptions that they get or whatever it may be. And like I said, the subscription model is great, but for the user, unless you fully utilize the app, like I said, if you're listening to Spotify, unless you're one of those people who listen to Spotify four or five hours a day, every day, as opposed to, you know, you listen to your favorite songs every once in a while, uh, someone's obviously getting more for their value than the other, where here, I feel like you can get more of an equitable value for what you use. And obviously, if you use the application a lot more, you're going to spend a lot more. But if you don't use the application quite as much, you're not going to spend quite as much. And I think we actually, I think all of us might have like two or three applications that we use all the time, while having a dozen or so applications that we use sometimes. And it would suck to have to pay or really have to be engaged with all these different advertisements or other monetization means uh, when we barely even use these things. And I think... I think it could be a huge thing for applications, but I think it could be a new means of how users interact with these applications. Of uh, how dApps may be able to be monetizable, uh, I think that's going to be a huge thing, and I think that's sort of a native attribute of the blockchain, uh, because like in terms of being able to bring in advertisements, I've seen that a lot actually, where people are like, "Oh, how could I have ads on the blockchain?" And I'm like, "Who says you want ads on the blockchain? Who says that there's not a better means of being able to monetize your applications or monetize your projects without essentially subject subjugating yourself to basically collecting data? That's really what an ad is. It's collecting data to." enter that into an advertiser market and then sell that data to an advertiser that wants to use that data to market to a certain demographic. Here, users can essentially, this is sort of really what it looks like to own your own data. Uh, to be able to interact with the things you want to interact with, you simply pay for them. But these fees could be a micropayment fee. They could be a tenth of a cent, a hundredth of a cent, half a cent, a penny, a couple cents. Like I said, with the Duolingo example, it's 30, if it's 30 bucks a, a year you may end up paying 20 bucks to unlock a module with like 10 different lessons in it and you may pay another 20 cents to unlock another module. And hey, maybe you see another, another module that you just don't feel like opening and you just skip that one. Um, it gives a lot more uh, variability to the user in terms of being able to choose for what they want and pay for exactly for what they want as opposed to just being given this all or nothing package or being subjugated to Really, so there's ads and then there's ads. I don't know if you guys have like dealt with this where, yeah, you might go on, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and yeah, there are ads. But how, how many times have you guys opened up one of those apps where it's like, oh, this is a cool app. And then like every five minutes, like the ad covers the whole screen. It's like 10 seconds before you can exit out. And then it has like a fake exit button. So it sends you to the app store. That is the worst. That is the absolute worst. And I just think that there's a better way to do it. And I think the blockchain has sort of a native means of doing so. So... I was hoping I could bring more people on to talk about this. I see people wanting to wanting to talk about it, but no, I think I think it's it's revolutionary. I think it changes the game, and I don't I don't really think I sort of get asked this a lot too, where it's like, Quincy, are you sure people want to pay to interact with the blockchain? I'm like, well, if it's a hundredth of a cent, if it's a tenth of a cent, actually paying a tenth of a cent for the for the uh, for the application is almost the equivalent of what an ad would cost to run. So that's essentially what you're paying for to jump ahead of the ad. It's like, hey, look, if I don't want an ad, I'm going to try to just pay the tenth of a cent or a hundredth of a cent, then essentially getting this annoying ad that's essentially ruining the product for me. No, okay, I think that's going to be a big thing. And one thing I actually wanted to sort of segue into that were tokenizing data. Sort of like what I said before about how advertisers would actively try to gather as much data or applications that had advertisers would try to gather as much data as possible to be able to essentially sell that data to these advertisers so they can market to specific demographics. Well, you could have a means of not only monetizing your own data, but applications can monetize data that they're able to use. And usually the best example I like to give of this is, let's say you had a smart contract or some app out there that uh, read a bunch of data off of a bunch of DEXs. Let's say it was like analysis data, whatever it may be. Well, you could have a bunch of whether it may be traders or investors, whatever it may be, they could essentially do that pay per execution model to be able to pull um, economic insights 
uh, based off of the analysis of all these DEXs or all these trades or whatever it may be. And now people have a means of being able to run analysis tools or run some level of analysis in a smart contract and then have people pay per execution to access that data because obviously that data would be uh, quite profitable for whether it be the trader, investor, whatever it may be because it gives them some level of analysis. But it's able to do it in such a manner that's so cheap rather than paying you know, 40 bucks for some analysis tool uh, as opposed to a tenth of a cent or a cent for specific analysis data. Um, and then people can essentially do, do what they want with that. But it can go in a lot of different ways. Uh, the biggest thing is whether it's some sort of aggregator, some sort of analysis tool, whether it's some sort of anything. Ideally, this data would be changed in some form or uh, this data would be contained for convenience purposes. Um, you could have an inf you could have an application that stores a bunch of data like a like a uh, database would, and then to access that data you pay a tenth of a cent, penny of a, uh, one penny, maybe even ten cents, whatever it may be, depending on the data. These, these could be leads, these could be whatever, and depending on how easy it is to access that data, um, could determine if that means of monetization could be profitable. And I know what everyone says. They always go, well, isn't the, isn't the blockchain public? Couldn't I run like a query on the blockchain and da 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 da? And it's funny because every time someone asks me this, I'm like, it might actually cost you more time and energy to create some random like server that's querying a full node every 15 minutes or every 10 minutes to get some information when you could have paid the 10th of a cent to be able to have the information on demand and be able to make your decisions off of it, as well as be able to build other smart contracts that can utilize that data on demand. So it's not really the data that's valuable, it's the access to the data in a convenient means that's valuable. And that sort of goes back to that my, to my Duolingo example, where if you want to learn Spanish, you can just open up a Spanish book. You know, you can find many tools to learn Spanish. But people go to Duolingo because of the ease of access. And obviously, they have their own strategies and tools and whatever it may be. But the ease of access to the data and the means in which they're able to access the data is really the true important part. And I think we can do the same sort of thing on the blockchain. Now, I don't think this is going to work for every single application. But I do think you're going to see a new wave of applications that are able to utilize this monetization method in terms of monetizing apps, monetizing data, being able to even tokenize data and then sell access to that data as a token. A lot of different ways you can go about this. But um, <laughs> one thing I wanted to bring, uh, food for thought, uh, I'm glad I have T's crypto up here. T's good having you. Uh, I love it when you invite me to your spaces. And one thing I brought up in your space yesterday, before I had to leave quite abruptly, I only had like five minutes, where when we see a lot of these different tokens, whether it be layer ones, whether it be dApps that have tokens, whether it be oracles, the huge question comes up of, what are they? Are they a security, a currency, a commodity? What are these things? And that's sort of like the million dollar question because that sort of determines how uh, institutions can interact with you. If you're a currency, uh, you may have different and more lenient rules than if you're a security. And if you're a commodity, you may have an entirely separate set of rules than being a currency or a security. And if you're completely something different, you may essentially have a whole bunch of rules made up for you because you're something entirely different. And one thing that, like I said, food for thought is what do we classify these new technologies? Even if we were to create something that's very similar to something that exists, like well, one thing that I've been working on for a little bit were uh, dividend yielding shares on the blockchain. So essentially these are tokens, they're really NFTs, but they're tokens associated with the dApp. And as the dApp has different, different users engage with it, pay per execution, those execution fees essentially get split amongst a set of uh, token holders in the form of dividends. And sort of the big question that I have is, well, typically a dividend yielding application that has some sort of shares associated with it is a security. But at the end of the day, these things are operating autonomously. So let's say I were to Satoshi it and launch some application out there and they never knew who created it. Would it still be a security if no one essentially runs the app, but it still issues dividends? It's, it's a very weird question in that. Or let's say I was able to tokenize some sort of product and that product has a means of being entirely autonomous, but is that product now like some sort of security because I essentially set it up in whatever way and traditionally it would be? Would it be some sort of new commodity because it's now able to, you know, generate whatever, whatever it's able to, like what do these things, what are these things classified as? And usually like right on the surface, uh, I used this example the other day, you know, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. But I'm like, what if you discovered a new species and it's not quite and you give it some food that a duck would eat and it kills it because it's not a duck. What do we do with that? And obviously that's sort of a silly example, but what happens if you essentially give some set of rules to an asset that operates based off of some preset of rules 
and it sort of starts breaking the rules unintentionally because it's not that thing. And you sort of see this with the security question, where it may go, oh, well, this is a security. Well, if it's a security under this organization, what happens if that organization goes bankrupt and that thing still exists? That's sort of a weird question to come across. Like, what security could you own in which the company goes bankrupt, yet you're still able to redeem dividends, or you're still able to trade the product, or you're still able to, whatever the application may be, you're still able to do that thing. Um, and usually where I come down to it is, we've got to start making different arguments for, we've got, we got to start making good arguments for what these things could be, do sort of like in the traditional way. So maybe I like to argue that layer ones are commodities um, and typically due to the notion that uh, the network is put together by a decentralized set of node operators and these node operators don't collab in any capacity and everything on top of that comes uh, the resources. And what comes with that is really interesting in which you need the token to be able to make an execution on the network uh, and that's like the basis of everything. I can't I can't execute an app or a DAP without holding some amount of the token to pay the execution fee. And it sort of turns into this like this weird energy commodity, sort of in the way that you need oil to run a machine. Um, I can't run an application without holding the cryptocurrency, if we want to call it a cryptocurrency. But um, and it's a weird thing because you may go, well, if it's a security, a security under who? The node operators. The node operators don't even know who the other node operators are. So it's a very weird thing to go. Okay, cool. It's a security under who? Well, under him. Okay, what if he shuts down his node, but all the other nodes are still up? Is it under that guy? Well, what if he shuts down his node and all the other nodes are still up? Is it under all of them? Well, they don't even know each other. So how are you going to essentially like govern that? And it's very. I think it's an interesting question to be had. But the biggest thing to be had with that is what type of arguments can we make to essentially like build our case for what these assets are and where it could be into the future. I don't know if it's, I don't know if we can quite make a case for these are something entirely new, even though they totally are, um, because that's not really how securities law works. They kind of just go off of their boy scouts that go off of the old rules and everything. But the biggest thing is like, can we make more rational, can we make more rational arguments to state that these things may reside in this basket for this reason. If it's a currency, why do you think it's a currency? If it is a security, what are certain aspects in securities law that applies to this? If it's a commodity, what arguments can we make to show that it's a commodity? And I don't think making the argument, and this sort of goes into that whole like ripple case or whatever, I don't think that making the argument that just because something's not this thing makes it automatically this other thing. Like I said, like you may go, it's not a duck, it's not a duck. Therefore, it's a bear. And it's like, well, just because it's not a duck doesn't mean it's a bear, but it's still not a duck. Um, but it's just really interesting with these. And at least where I'm in, in the space, anything that I do, I find I am like preemptively like ready to be under some love, high level of scrutiny uh, just because, you know, I don't want to build something really cool and become super successful and then I get sued to oblivion out of ignorance. But the biggest thing is, is like, well, crap, like, it's almost like you have to arm yourself with all these different arguments and be able to know the best arguments that can be made against you in terms of what these things may be classified as, and then sort of act in the best faith that you can to be able to uh, support that argument and move forward with that project. But even then, it's not going to save you. So it's one of those things where it's a very interesting thing in where the space is going. And I think, I actually think, at least in the United States, I have no idea what's going to go on in the rest of the world. But at least in the United States, just like there's the Security Exchange Commission, I think there may be the Crypto Exchange Commission or the Digital Asset Exchange Commission or whatever it may be. And they may have a whole new set of categories that may be similar to the current categories, uh, but they may have a whole new set of rules established for these. And, you know, best case scenario, worst case scenario, they just use the old rules and they just start putting these things in these random boxes and something that's clearly not a duck is classified as a duck. But <laughs> that's sort of my, uh, my two cents on that. Food for thought. Um, in terms of where I'm sort of where my head's at in the space and, and where I'm going. But like I said, when I see things like tokenizing commodities or even tokenizing data, when you tokenize data and it means in which it's autonomous, what if that data is being generated by a set, like I said, with the, with the uh, an analysis application, that analysis application is only reading analysis data off of a set of decentralized entities, whether that be a bunch of random traders, a bunch of random DEXs, like what is that classified as if people are able to profit off of the means of people utilizing that application? And maybe there's a set of shareholders that automatically are able to get dividends based off of that and nobody's running it. Like what do you classify this new asset that's able to profit off of uh, issuing data with when there's really no central issuer and there's really no central like repository in which it gets its data it gets its data decentrally it operates decentrally and it operates autonomously so what is it i think it's a really interesting question to be had there and 
I mean, I don't know who's going to make the best argument, but whoever does needs to step up. <laughs> I would love to say it's me, but I don't know if I'm a great debater. Uh, I'm a great, like, idea idealist or futurist, but I don't know if I'm a great debater. But um, it's just food for thought, just questions to be had, and just ideas to be explored. Because I think before we start seeing the huge adoption in terms of these technologies, especially by whether it be institutions, whether it be uh, third, people in a third world countries being able to utilize these technologies, or even people here being able to utilize new applications that operate differently, who knows what's gonna happen in terms of how these things are governed? Because that's really what's gonna determine how these things are able to grow and how fast they're able to grow.